Anders and Cooper is. <laughs> You'll have to explain that later. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think we've just uh, gone live. Uh, it's Tim Topham here, of course, and um, we, uh, well, I am over here in Florida for a change, which puts me in the tame t same time zone, finally, or close to, uh, as the two gentlemen that I'm about to introduce you to. Uh, and uh, today, I'm really excited to be joined by these guys because they've sprung to my attention in the last six months due to the way that they've been helping other teachers in Facebook groups in particular, and also the appearance of a new podcast for music teachers. Uh, which um, has been coming up and I'll introduce you to in, the, in a moment. But firstly, let's welcome Dave. From, he was featured on uh, the first episode of my podcast this year talking about preschool music programs that rock. Dave owns Dave Simon's Rock School, a large multi-age and multi-instrument music school teaching kids from preschool age to adults using his signature Kids Rock and Junior Rockers programs, which he also licenses to other teachers. Dave, welcome to today's live chat. Thanks for coming along. Great. Thank you for having me here. And Danny, the guy with the beard in the middle, is the co-owner of the Music Factory School of Music in California. And along with the Music Factory, Dana, Danny is the drummer for the iconic 90s punk band Face to Face, about to go on tour, actually. Um, and in 2017, he put his geeky business side into full display by starting the Music Lesson Business Academy podcast and has also been creating an online business course for music school owners and teachers recently. Danny, welcome aboard. Up. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you guys. Now, I have to say, Danny, I almost had to cancel having you on the show today because I was listening to a podcast and you talked about the fact that you were drinking wine and <laughs> Coke Zero at the same time, and I almost felt sick. <laughs> Don't knock it. I, I swear to God, it's uh, it's really good. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not it's good. I'm not the only one who does it. It's like you drink your wine, you know, you enjoy your wine, but then the Coke Zero is like it. You know, you're not mixing them together. It's kind of a refreshing uh, palate cleanser. Wait a minute. I mean, this is coming from a guy that eats Vegemite, okay? <laughs> um, Actually. Before, before the broadcast started, we were, we were already jabbing each other about California wine versus Australian wine. So, you know, we're going down the right path here. I think so. We'll have to agree to disagree on the wine and Coke, though. But uh, look, anyway, today's chat is all about practice and particularly whether the practice expectations we set for students is actually helping or hindering our teaching businesses. And uh, I was made to think really deeply about this by the podcast that Danny and Dave put out uh, probably a few weeks ago now. Uh, it really got me thinking. And so I thought, we've got to get you guys on to chat about this because I wanted to talk some more with you about it. But firstly, to Dave. All of this came about because into the views of his students' parents about outcomes and expectations for their music lessons. So, Dave, can you tell us about what you did and what you found out? Yeah, you know, it, it first um, started out as very loose conversations with parents about what uh, motivated them to seek out music lessons in the first place. And through that, I started hearing this uh, common message about um, practice and a fear that the parents had that they would, um, that their child could uh, fail in music lessons because they're not practicing. So I decided to formalize my questions more as a survey. And I sat down with about 15 parents, asked them three questions pertaining to some random, you know, enrichment activity. And then I'd apply it to music lessons and I got different results, which made, which made me realize that um, parents, are coming into music lessons with a, a much different expectation than they do at any other um, art or sports activity. Right. Yeah. And so, tell us about the specific question you were asking them, and and what the what you expected them to say, and what the actual response was, because I think that's the crucial thing. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I initially asked them what what benefit or hope they thought um, that the enrichment activity would bring for their child. What um, what did they fear, um, a, a, you know, failure would look like or, a, a, you know, a not positive outcome? And then what what would success look like or what would success look like? And with every um, enrichment activity, they always said that their hope was very simple, that their child would ex experience personal growth from the activity. They never said 
well, my hope is that the child will become um, a, a great baseball player. Okay. In a minute. Did I lose you guys? Oh, there I am. I'm no, back. I'll still go. And still then, then their their fear was that their child um, that their child's self esteem could be impacted by failure in the activity, and that um, success was that the child was happy and experienced personal growth and wanted to continue on with the activity. But with music, they really got hung up on practice. The practice was the thing that um, was their biggest fear. That they feared that you know their child wouldn't practice and they hate music lessons in the way that they hated music lessons. And um, success really came down to practice. And I would kind of call them out on the inconsistencies that they were um, expressing. And that led to some really interesting conversations. More importantly, I realized that parents are really open to being re-educated on this topic. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, it's about us actually rethinking our own expectations and then making sure that parents understand that uh, we are rethinking things as well. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure the connection, we, we might have missed a few little bits of what you were saying there, but I think to kind of summarize it all up, really the response from your parents was that their expectation for music was that kids would practice. And that was, that was uh, a given. Whereas their expectation for baseball, softball, dance, gym, anything like that was not practice it was about just having fun and enjoying enjoying the experience and so why is there this dichotomy between those events and music is is the question right and uh, and i think in your in your summary in the discussion that you and, and danny had like, the 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 reason people think like this is just because of what we've all gone through as students ourselves and it's just kind of an assumption that we've all made so maybe it's time to rethink that what do you think danny well i i think the key point um, that Dave discovered is how they're measuring the success of the lessons. So they were saying, we measured the success of if my child is enjoying music by how much they practiced, you know, and that, that's the big difference right. is that we're measuring success with the baseball team or soccer or the footy game based on the child wanting to go and participate in the game, you know, go to practice after school, but you know, they're not doing, that stuff at home in the backyard. Whereas with music, they didn't measure the success based on does the student want to come to the lesson every week? Do they want to be in a recital? Do they enjoy it? They were saying we measure success purely based on how likely are they to just go and sit at the piano by themselves. So I think that's, right. the, key, that's the key distinction and why it hit me like a ton of bricks when we really started going down that road is I thought, okay, so they're already coming in. We all know that new students, getting them to practice at all is a struggle. So they're already coming in set up to fail to some extent, right? In the mind of the parents, they're coming to us set up to fail. Then your teacher, because this is how we've always done it, the teacher does a lesson with them and does the wrap up with the parent and says, yeah, they're doing great. If they could just practice a little bit more on this part right here, that would be great. So then the, the, the teacher even emphasizes it more, right? And is driving them farther down the road of, of measuring it in a way that we already just heard from the parents is gonna fail. And that's where it was like the light <laughs> right. bulb, like, okay, this has got to change. Yeah, I, I totally had a light bulb moment when I was listening to you guys talk because I'd never really stopped to think about the expectations that I'd set with my students. It's like, Oh, we lost Tim. Tim was gone. Well, Danny, it's you and me now. Right. <laughs> Dave right. and I are doing another podcast. <laughs> okay, we've got Tim taped up here. We taped him to the chair. We have hijacked <laughs> you know. Wait, there he's back. This is the Tim Topham live Facebook hosted by Danny and Dave. Right. And um, we have realized that Tim does not know who um, – um, Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper is. Thank you. <laughs> everyone in the world knows who Anderson Cooper is, and he's back. They do have CNN in Australia. I'm sure they have their own version of Anderson Cooper. <laughs> there he I is. Think, uh, 
I'm here. I'm here. I think my connection is is really struggling to to do this today. <laughs> and I thought you guys had really good Wi-Fi here in America. <laughs> I know. I, was say, I don't know how you pull this off from Australia because if there's one thing that I would complain about on my visits to Australia is that the hotels charge like twenty five dollars a day for what's practically dial up internet service. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep, our internet is like 56th worst in the world, apparently. So <laughs> we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, so look, I, I actually um, was was interested in in this whole concept because I had a, I have a student who's a teenager, he's just moved to high school uh, and has been really struggling to to get his foothold in, in the new school. And so he's just done no work at home at all, but loves music, loves piano um i was you know and his mum of course is saying oh tim look really sorry uh, he hasn't done any work this week and i'm like oh that's that but now i've actually just taken the pressure right off and i've said mate come to these lessons let's just have some fun i know you're having some troubles at school and it's it's been tough and you got a lot of work so let's just come and have these lessons and have a great time and you know what the pressure's just off now and the the uh, interactions between me and the mum and the son are all different, and uh, and I think it's just going to have a, a big impact because down the track he will get he'll get in the swing of things, and I'm sure he'll be encouraged to play again. One thing I did want to talk about was was this idea about um, the, the change being the for the teacher when you're starting beginner saying. We shouldn't encourage students to practice at all, but just at the start, that's the time when instrument and doing things in lessons. And then later on, hopefully, we'll, we'll have motivated and excited the student enough that they'll want to go and pick up their guitar or sit down at the piano themselves and do it. Just like a kid who's learning soccer or going to soccer games or playing basketball will, after a while, if they're enjoying it, they'll start shooting hoops at home or going down to the park or whatever. That, that's the, the kind of correlation between the sports and the music, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, think, I think what's, you know, having talked to a lot of the teachers about this and getting feedback in the Facebook groups and stuff. I think it's important to, you know, we're not said, we're not saying we want to discourage somebody who starts music, who ought to, who wants to practice. Of course not. We would love every student to practice. Uh, we're just changing the way that it's measured. We're changing the expectation of how the parent measures it. So it's not, it's still, you know, we don't want to say now, whatever you do, don't go home from this lesson and practice. We're not, <laughs> we're not saying that. We're, we're just the teacher has to be a, just a little more aware of the way that they are putting that they're framing that when they're talking to the parents and the students they can't make it seem like you have to go home and do this if the student is practicing we want to encourage that if they come back and clearly they worked on their assignment and they're doing great with it of course you want to encourage that and, and keep them moving along it's just changing that expectation. So I think it's real, we have to be very careful to make sure people don't think that we are saying, don't practice. We don't want you to practice. That That's not it at all. No, right. And in some ways it, it takes the pressure off the teacher in that there isn't this, this expectation and worry and concern that someone hasn't practiced in these first few lessons or lessons because really is to motivate and inspire and engender a love of the instrument right from the beginning and that is the most important thing and then the practice will follow from that and that actually is more puts more on the teacher about how they're going to do it, right yeah and I think that um, there has to be a, a desire that forms for the child you know to practice I, I think when a child first starts music lessons, that practice should be a therapeutic experience for them, where the hard work, the heavy lifting, the real structure happens in the lesson. And then when they go home, they're, um, they're just relaxing on the piano. They're playing music, they're not practicing it. And I think there's a real difference there. There might not be as much structure at home. One thing I've seen with my own kids is that they don't, it's hard for them to structure their time. They need that mentor or that adult in the room with them to structure their time. 
And um, when the kid's at home with their instrument, you're, the instructor's not in, in the room with them. So they have to manage that time on, on their own and just letting them kind of figure that out and not putting pressure on them to do, you know, number one, two, and, and three at home, but just uh, to just be with music and be on their instrument, I think is of great value. And I don't know if Tim's with us. Mm. Yeah, I hear. No, I'm, I hear. I'm here. Are oh, you okay? Because your your pick your <laughs> image is frozen. Okay, um, I'm, my, uh, I'm, I'm definitely listening. My son doesn't know how to practice. That's he can't go through those processes without his teacher. Um, and 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 I think we have to take that into consideration. Is that they need that mentor at at home, and we can't be there at home with them. Mm. Danny, on your podcast, uh, you mentioned that one of your parents had asked, uh, sorry, one of your, yes, your parents had asked their teacher, because you have multiple teachers at your school, um, how much should he, ex-student, be practicing? Uh, tell us what your teacher to parent, because you've obviously started discussing this thing with them. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been rolling it out with the teachers. I, I, I think... You know, the main approach, I'm trying to remember that exact circumstance, but, um, you know, I think I'm presenting it as they, that they don't really have to practice at all at the beginning. If they want to practice and they're doing it naturally, we're going to encourage that. But just don't worry about it. If they don't pick up that, you know, if they don't pick up the instrument at all until they come back next week for their lesson, that that's okay. And and just really getting them to understand what what – if you explain it to him from the standpoint of, listen, Mr. Customer, what we're going to do with your kid right now is make try our best to make them fall in love with playing music. If we do that, we know that six months from now, the word practice will never need to be mentioned because your kid's going to go home and pick up the guitar because they're having a blast and that they've fallen in love with it and they want to be in one of our bands or whatever their goal may be. But, um, you know... Again, we have to be careful to not, you know, tell them don't practice at all. We're not doing that. But um, the teachers just, you know, they're so used to how it's been done for 100 years that when they get that question from a parent, you know, they're going to say, OK, if they can do 20 minutes three times a week, that's going to be great. Right. And then we know that that's not going to happen. And then the parent's going to go, well, they're not doing the three 20 minute practice sessions. I guess we're going to pull them from lessons, you know. And, right. and that kid's never even getting the opportunity to fall in love with the bigger picture of playing music, you know? And, and once you fall in love with it, well, then you're just going to go home and pick up your guitar instead of doing other things because you love playing guitar. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, uh, now, th this is – go on, Dave. I was wondering if I could um, share with you kind of – because I've been asking around a lot, trying to get a sense of where this um, – discrepancy came from with music and other arts. Is it all right if I talk about that for a second, or it sounds like you had. Yeah, uh, no, no, go. So I think here's my sort of take on it is that there's been a cultural shift and a musical shift. If you look at our grandparents, great grandparents, if they wanted to play, first of all, playing an instrument allowed people to hear music. You know, in the turn of the century, if you wanted to hear music, someone had to play it. So there was already more pressure on them and they had to learn how how to read it. I think with the, the rock and roll era and the pop music era, we're dealing with a type of music that um, can be more accessible than, you know, learning a Beethoven uh, piano sonata. So if you want to play Beethoven on the piano, you're probably going to have to to be a, a good reader and you're gonna have to learn some skills when you're dealing with simple pop songs um we're dealing with a different style that's it, more accessible and i feel like as music the music education industry hasn't hasn't adapted to it that we're still using the classical mode of education and saying to the you know the student on the first day okay let's learn how to read if you want to learn how to play taylor swift you got to learn how to read and I'm realizing, no, the reading can come later, that you can, within 15 seconds, I'm sorry, 15 minutes, have a kid playing some, you know, basic pop music. So I, I just think 
the the musical and cultural shift has happened, and as educators, we got to catch up to it. Well, and, yeah, right. and I would and, say, you know, the, the the idea is if they fall in love by starting off with playing something simple that they don't have to learn a lot of theory or learn a lot of reading, as they get into their instrument, they will naturally explore and start presenting to their teacher, hey, I want, you know, I've seen this over and over with guitar students where they're, they come in and we're, we're teaching them a Green Day song. And four years later, that student's with us and I, I go in there and the kid is doing jazz chords because they've progressed. They've become a guitar right. player. Now they want to, exp- now they, they want to do the whole thing. I did that as a drummer. I can't play jazz to save my life. Okay. But at a certain point in my lessons, that's what my teacher was working on with me. And I explored those, you know, that style of music and playing those things, which then ultimately helped me in being a better, you know, straight ahead rock drummer. And, you know, I think, again, if they, I think all, all these things are solved by just making the person fall in love with the idea and enjoyment of playing the instrument. Everything else will just fall. I mean, really, it's going to fall into place. Yeah. Right. And I think everyone would agree with that that sentiment, but I know that this discussion is going to totally blow the minds of some (laughs) teachers. Uh, uh, I think we'll be called heretics uh, by some people as well. Um, and uh, and that's okay. I've had a little bit of time to think about this and process it. And, and I think you, the three of us, we're all uh, thinking about this still and how it might look and how it might work and, and discussing it. That's why I wanted to get you guys on to do this. So it's by no means, you know, we have decided and proclaimed that this is the thing you must do. It's more... Dave, you just you had this question that you asked the parents, and it's really made you think. You've talked about that with Danny, and now I've heard about it, and I, I'm now thinking about it. So I guess what I'm hoping is that other teachers have a bit of a think about this, and uh, and whether their expectations that they've set uh, are due for a rethink, or whether they're happy with them as they are, I guess. And Dave, I wanted to follow up because you've actually rethought this in a little bit more detail, and, and sort of given three sections are looking at practice um, and you've called it your musical child I think can you just tell us about how you've kind of laid this out Tim before Dave, yeah take before it Dave goes into that, can I can I touch on something that I think will, will um, rest at ease a lot of the teachers um, sure if you are a university level instructor and the students that are coming to you are teenagers and above who've already made a choice that music is going to be their life and that they want to go to whatever prestigious music university is out there. What we're talking about isn't going to apply to them. If you have a right. music school, um, so, such as our friends down, you know, who do teacher zone, Los Rios rock school, their students are, you know, they ask their students when they sign up, is music what you think about all day long? Do you have to play music or you're not happy? If that kid says, well, I kind of like it, but I also like to skateboard, they go, we're not the right school for you. So if you have that model in your business, then this isn't something that you would even need to worry about. Because the pushback that I get from, and I hear from teachers is, well, I'm a serious teacher. I only want serious students, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. If that's your brand identity, then that's what you should you should go for. But what we're talking about is if your goal is to share music and the benefits of music with as many people as possible, then this is maybe a concept that you want to think about. If you are building a piano studio where students have to audition to get in, well, of course, you know, those people are going to have to practice every day. And this isn't something that would, you know, that they should be thinking about. But that's a decision that each a uh, business owner and, and instructor or music school needs to make. I think it's an important point. Yep. Um, okay, so you want me to, um, yeah, let's talk a little, you know, Danny and I have talked a lot about, okay, this is great that we've addressed the problem. Now, now we got to fix it. We've got to come up with some system. And you know, Danny and I, we both said that it's got to be simple. It's got to be comprehensive. Um, and it's really all about re-educating the parents. So your music, um, right now my working title is Your Musical Child, Rethinking 
practice. Um, and there's just three levels, level one, level two, and level three. And it just lays out, here's what the goal is at each level. And here's what the method, the methodology is. Really level two and level three are what everyone who's teaching music is doing anyway. You know, level, you know, it's level, it's introducing this new level of the kid who's new to playing an instrument and um, hasn't been inspired yet to, to, to play music at home. And it's really saying to the parent, your child can achieve the, the growth and the benefits that you want and they don't have to practice. I mean, really it's this level one that, that we're talking about and it puts um, the parent's mind at ease and it takes pressure off of the, the teacher. Um, so the teacher doesn't have to send the kid home each week with, with an assignment. I think Danny and I talked about this in the podcast about there's a big difference when you say to a, a student, next week in the lesson, here's what we're doing, as opposed to saying, I want you to go home and, and, and practice this. It's a, it's, right. it's a different mindset. So yeah, trying to formalize um, the system and, you know, putting some scripts together having um, one thing I'm working on is having a poster made up of your music, uh, you know, your musical child and having it hang in all my teaching studios. So when a parent turns to the, to the um, teacher and says, how, how often should my child be practicing? They now have this infographic that they can um, reference as they're talking. And more importantly, the parents need to get educated on, on the front end when they come into the studio with with a video and with a handout of this um, inf infographic. Right, yeah. And the three levels, I don't know, in the podcast, I think you called them like a novice or be beginner. Did, right. Have you changed your plan, your thinking about those words? Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to make the language, you know, even the words, originally it was novice, practitioner, and expert. And I felt like those are maybe too clinical sounding. Right. Um, Dan and I had talked about, oh, maybe we could do like this karate thing, white belt, yellow belt. And instead, we're just going to, you know, I'm thinking of simple, just level one, level two, level three. Right. Okay. And so what what the biggest change is that level two and level three are both uh, levels where we would expect students to be playing at home and uh, engaged in music in their own time. You're saying actually, there's probably a level one before that which is the level of complete newbie who maybe we can take a different approach at with. Right. Maybe we don't throw the method book in front of them right away. That's right. the big, yep. you know, hey, kid, what do you like? What do you listen to? What's your favorite song? You're going to now learn and experience music through the filters of your, um, your love of music. We're going to build on that love of music, and I'm not going to put a method book in front of you. I think, and I think that's a kind yeah. of a radical concept. Well, it's one that I've been uh, pushing for a very long time. And in actual fact, I created my own no method book beginner course for piano <laughs> teachers because I'm, I'm very much like that. So I, I recommend teachers don't start using method books for at least five weeks. Uh, my course goes up to 10 weeks of just engagement in music, creating music, wow. listening, singing, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, um, it. it's such a great approach. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I was curious I, how have your students responded to that? Oh, they love it. They're not, you know, the, the, the first thing they aren't being introduced to is reading, which is obviously one of the hardest things. So, uh, uh, the, the, in the year in is heaps better because they've got a much better sense of rhythm and they understand a few keys and chords and scales and things like that. So it's been a, a very big shift, which has had a lot of success. That's great. That's, uh, that sounds amazing. I think, you know, another thing that Dave really had mentioned that hit home with me regarding this whole thing was, you know, our teachers are used, again, are used to doing it a certain way, but what they have to remember is the way that they did it was based on their goals, right? And we have to remember, we're all people that decided that music was going to be our life. When these students are first coming to you, that's not their goal. And even after years of practice with you, that may not be their goal. They're, you know, 99.99999% of everybody who plays music does it for enjoyment and no other reason whatsoever. So, you know, when, you, when you're a teacher who went to music college and you're, you're teaching the way that your professors taught you, you know, 
they have to remember you'd already made this huge life decision. So your goal was to be this amazing pianist or voice, you know, uh, singer or whatever your instrument is. When the nine year old comes in, their goal is totally different, you know, and they probably don't even have a musical goal because their parents are bringing them in with that mindset of, we want our child to get the benefits that we know music can do for them. So the teacher has to do that shift that their goal, it, you know, they're presenting the, the students too often with their goal, which is to get good and to be able to read and to play these pieces. The goal of the student might be totally different and our job is to find out what that goal is for those students. Right, agreed. You know, Tim, Danny reminded, I want to share with you guys, and Danny made me think of this, of some additional results I got from the survey. And I think as both sales, as, as salespeople and educators, we can really use to our advantage. One is um, 14 of the 15 parents I interviewed had very painful memories about their music lessons. Two, <laughs> To the point where they even like they started shifting in their chairs, their body language changed. There was gas. That's so sad. Right, right. So it made me realize, okay, this is the kind of think of, you know, the whole story brand, you know, approach. We can really use that to our advantage and reassure the parent that this is not this will not happen to your child here. That's not going to happen. And they also all you know, because I would I'd call them out on this discrepancy. I would say, why are you um, putting pressure on your child to practice? They all, I think 13 of the 15 had a had a, an agreement, a verbal arrangement with their child that if they don't practice, they're going to take them out of lessons. And I said, well, if you take them out of lessons because they're not practicing, aren't you denying your child what the very thing that you hope your child would get? And that would trip them up a little bit. But they all believe that music has something special. There's some unique component in music that the other enrichment, um, um, uh, the, the other enrichment programs don't have. And they think there's a lot of research, a lot of articles out there about the, the benefits that music can have on your brain. And that's something else that we can really use, you know, focusing on the benefits of music and then the fear that the parents have. Um, we can use it as both um, as business owners and educators. Right. Yep. Well, look, it's a great summary. I didn't want to uh, be speaking for too long. Uh, so I think that's probably uh, been a really good way to just spark thinking so much for that. Uh, just before we kind of close it up, did you want to say anything else, um, Danny or Dave, just to kind of summarize your thinking or any tips for teachers who might be a little bit confronted by this? <laughs> any thoughts, uh, Danny, first? Um, yeah, for, I mean, for the teachers, I think you just have to really decide who you're going to be. You know, who is your student? Who, what is the goal of you as a teacher? My goal at my school is going to be different than, uh, you know, another teacher, you know, maybe who's an independent, uh, you know, just piano teacher. You have to decide who you want to be. And then once you decide that, lean into it. If what we're talking about isn't who you want to be as a teacher or the type of students that you want to have, that's totally okay. You just have to make that decision and then go full force into that. The indecision um, is what's going to kill you. In, in trying to build a business and you're going to be unhappy in what you're doing. So deciding who you want to be and then saying, this is what my music teaching business is going to look like. And then you just lean into it and go. Okay. Thinking Danny uh, and Dave. Yeah. I just, here's, here's a little sales tip um, that, that I've used. It's really resonated with parents. I say to parents, we teach music the same way kids learn language. They listen, they imitate, they speak, and then they learn how, how to read. And that really um, resonates with, with, with parents. I and mean, music is, is, is a language, and, and why not learn music the same way you learn, learn a, any other language? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I've, I've promoted this uh, theory for a long time in uh, music kind of uh, circles, at least it's called music learning theory. Oops, sorry. I'm just checking out uh, the comments that we've got here. Let me just uh, mute this. <laughs> just having a look at live. Um, music learning theory. Have you, have you heard of that as a concept? No. So, okay, you guys have got to look up Dr. Edwin Gordon. 
his research. It's called Music Learning Theory, and he is exactly in line with you there, saying we should be teaching music in exactly the same way as we teach language, which is uh, the first thing people do is listen. They uh, improvise or they babble, you know, in language, and then eventually they'll get around to forming sentences, and then they'll start reading, and then they'll learn to write, uh, whereas unfortunately so much of music is uh, all a little bit mixed up uh, and starts with the reading, of course. Uh, I'm just okay. having a look at, um, we've, we had, had a few people watching and um, Tara Wright says, um, I gave a presentation to my MTNA group this morning on this very topic. And she says, preach, <laughs> in capitals. So there, there you go. And we've had a number of people uh, watching. So uh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much to everyone who's uh, tuned in today or tuned in, as I would wow. say if I was uh, here in America, right? Tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. Um, very good. Wow. <laughs> good on you, Tim. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to show you my full American accent because it's too embarrassing. But I will say, just to, just to finish off, that you guys must ch check out our So it's called uh, Music Lesson Business Academy. It's on iTunes, iTunes, and uh, find um, information about it if you Google it. And Dave is a regular uh, guest on Danny's show. So look up those episodes um, on practice. Uh, they really got me thinking and that was the whole genesis of this discussion. So guys, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, really nice to be in your time zone. Yeah. And, Welcome to Florida. Uh, and perhaps we'll... Thank you and uh, see you all soon. Great, see you guys. Thanks so much.